This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in the book of Revelation in chapter 21, verse 1. Now, before we begin, let's make sure that we're right with the Lord by confessing our known sins according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. The most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and everything you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 21, as you probably are aware of, has some fascinating topics. Let's just get right into it. I want to give you uh, some of the... Uh, orientation we need as we enter the last two books of the chapter. Chapter 21 opens with the last, uh, the eighth scene from the third vision. Let me just show you all eight scenes right quick. I'll put them on the board. I'm not going to read through them all, but we've went through these carefully. We are doing number eight, the new heavens and the new earth. Now we begin the new heavens and the new earth in 21, 1 through 8. And this gives a contrast to the eternal punishment of the unbeliever. Admittedly, both of these descriptions are difficult for us to comprehend. But that doesn't lessen their reality. People sometimes, well, they often do, reject the notion of God in a judgment, but that doesn't make it any less real. These are stark realities that we're, we are studying uh, and will continue to study. Let me give you a quick look at the outline. See if I can get it all on there, I'm not sure, but we have looked at this and we finish up number five uh, in this section, the new heaven and the new earth. So you see that overlap with the uh, scene that we're looking at, number eight. <clears throat> so now we have the final scene of the third vision, which is the first eight verses of chapter 21. And as you will see, it's rather brief and in eight verses, we basically get a description of the new heavens and new earth that is, it's more like a introduction. Much more will come in the rest of the chapters. So let's begin verse 21. I mean, chapter 21, verse one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had passed away and the sea existed no more. Now, some of your translations may say for the former, uh, that's the idea. You don't want them to get confused. There's a first, there's a second, there's a third. But it is the first. But at the same time, it's also the former. Let's break this down. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. Now, this does allude to some scriptures in the Old Testament. The Old Testament does talk about the new heavens and new earth, though in large part it talks about the millennial kingdom. And I've tried to show you how those are connected. But it alludes to passages like Isaiah 65, 17, uh, 66, 22, uh, Psalm 102, uh, 25, and following. Let's look at Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Now that's interesting in itself, the former things. Does that include sin, people you've known who are not in heaven? I would think so. Verse 22 goes on to say, For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your descendants and your name endure. So verse 22 is making a comparison. Just as the new heavens and new earth, which I make, will endure before me, the Lord speaking, Notice it, capital L-O-R-D, that's Yahweh. So were your descendants, those of yours who have descended from you who are saved. 
and your name endure. You'll go on forever, just as the new heavens and the new earth. Let's talk about the sea for a moment. <clears throat> the sea up here is often depicted as chaotic or evil. Uh, it's hostile to man. That was a common notion in the world, as it still is today. It's not a place you can live without some sort of major uh, uh, platform or something under you, right? An earth or a boat or something. But it's always hostile to man. It's deadly. It's also symbolic of chaos and judgment. Uh, it's completely gone. It'll be no threat in any way to anybody on planet Earth because it's not there anymore. That means, apparently, there's going to be a lot of land. Sin had infected the earlier creation with all its rebellion, its crying, its pain, and its death. So a replacement order is needed, suited for a new set of immortal beings, a new order of life where sin is non-existence, existent, without crying, pain, and death. And we'll see the description in the negative here in a few moments. Now, there's some debate over where, whether there is a renewal of the old earth. Let me give some scriptures where people can draw that. Romans 8, 19 through 22, Acts 3, 21, Matthew 19, 28. Now, I'm going to give you these verses. Uh, that's up to you to look them up, but I'm not going to read them all, but they're there available for you. You can just pause and look them up or copy them to something you want to look up later. Or is this a complete new created heavens and earth? Now let's look at some scriptures on that. Psalm 102, 25 through 26, Isaiah 34, 4, 51, 6, Matthew 24, 35, 2 Peter 3, 7, 2 Peter 3, uh, 10 through 13. And what you, I think you'll uh, discover when you look up these scriptures, and I do expect you to look up some of them, just don't take my word for it, let the word speak to your heart directly, is that the dominant meaning of the scriptures, in other words, the prevailing view after you look through these scriptures is that, and I'm not saying it causes more scriptures, but because the meaning is overwhelming, that there's a complete dissolving here, and we're seeing it in these verses or vanishing of the old and the bringing on of a new creation of heavens and earth. So it's gone, okay? The millennium, on the other hand, there was a remodeling, is one way to put it, a rejuvenation of the earth. Uh, there's similar terms we could use, but you get the idea. It's redone, okay? They redid the whole house, put in new appliances, new flooring, did the root, you know, they, it's going to be redone, fitted for that thousand year reign of Christ. So what we have here, God has let the old creation run its course with the devil, his followers, uh, sin, sinful mankind, the rebellion. That's erased entirely. In other words, the entire former creation, including the heavens. Now, what all that involves uh, at least the sky does include space. Uh, the third heaven where God dwells, that's unclear. But it could be. If God wants to start over, maybe he'll give himself a new place also. So from this new heaven comes a new Jerusalem. That's verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. All right, first phrase, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Well, this connects us to, of course, um, the reality of the past. Keeping the name Jerusalem, it was also called the holy city. As such, it served as the central city in Israel and the world that God had set apart to himself for his resident temple, and primary place of worship for his people. It also has a place in the millennial kingdom as well with the millennial uh, uh, temple. 
uh, in it. So there's a connection to the past. But this city is new. It comes down from heaven. It's not on the old earth. It's already there when it's created. It has to come down from heaven, indicating, notice, coming down out of heaven from God, it has heavenly origin. It will be the place from which God will dwell on earth with his people. I should say in which God will dwell on earth with his people and rule. It's described as holy, but this time it's perfectly holy. It comes that way. Sin does not have to be dealt with, uh, with the people that's in it anymore. There's no sin. Uh, sin is not available <laughs> because there is no sin or rebellion anymore among the people of God. So it's going to be perfectly holy all the time for eternity. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, that's a lot to, to, to grasp. That's a lot to take in. You mean nothing of sin or nothing rebellion? Exactly. Now, maybe you can't fully appreciate that, and that's understandable until we get there and see why it has to be that way, or we can get somewhat of an understanding right now. But you can have God coming down to dwell with people who are still sinful and the potential of sin forever. If you're going to change things forever, it has to be perfect, holy for God and his people. So again, it shows its heavenly origin coming down out of heaven from God. It's described as prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Let's talk about the idea of bride here. Uh, the word is nymphae. It means about to be married or newly married woman. Uh, adorned for her husband. Jerusalem arrives beautifully prepared for her husband. That's the idea. So it's as if God and Jerusalem are going to be together as a husband and new wife. Okay? So the idea again of the city of Jerusalem being a bride comes from the personal relationship that God will have with his people and his presence with them. A nice reminder is that those who belong to God, you and me, have the name on us as designated citizens of the city. What do I mean? Do you remember Revelation 3.12? Let me look at that with you. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. That's a fixture. You're going to be fixed in the temple. And he will never go out of it anymore. You'll be fixed in the sense that you will be remembered, honored. You are part of it. Uh, this whole scene here. Notice this one. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem. You're going to be labeled as gods. Which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So you're going to get your new name, including the name of, uh, the name of my God, the name of the city, Jerusalem. A lot of wonderful concepts here that we cannot fully grasp yet. In verse 3, we have the descent of the Father. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Uh, folks, this is big. It's really big. Notice three times in this one verse. It tells us that God's going to be among men, among believers. Now, unbelievers are out of the picture right now, though we'll get a description of them a little bit later, uh, being the ones out of the picture. Let's break it down. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, an important announcement is made. When it's loud like this, a loud voice, I should have said, and I heard a loud voice. In other words, listen up. Since this is about God, it's probably not God making this announcement. 
first thing he said, Behold, look, pay attention, look here. The dwelling place, the skene, the tabernacle, the tent, that goes back to the Old Testament name for the tabernacle that was, you know, being carried around and set up in the wilderness for 40 years. Alluding back to the Old Testament where God's glory was with his people. The tabernacle had appeared in earlier visions and revelation. We saw that in 3.6 and 15.5. But now it is on the earth. Represents God's dwelling place. Of God is among men. Interesting word for men here. It's the word anthropos. Let me show that to you. It, obviously it is the word from which we get uh, many words related to men, anthropology and so on. Anthropos, men, it can be translated people. Now, I don't translate it people because we have another word here in a sentence or two that is translated people, and that's a different word, so we're going to keep it different here. Basically, it means human beings as we know it today, but they'll be in their transformed bodies. So this tells us that God will live in the new Jerusalem, a heavenly dwelling now on the new earth among his people. Remember, it came down from heaven. So this heavenly city is brought down and set upon the new earth. God is dwelling on earth with his people. This tells us this is a fellowship like never before. This is eternal fellowship with God. Now, I will tell you, this is hard to understand. It will be so wonderful. Now, I can tell you what it says, but to grasp this and appreciate it, I think it takes another level of thinking that I'm not sure we have now. I, I don't have it. Uh, admittedly, I'm, I'm trying to wrestle with some of these things. What does this mean, really? Does it have something I'm missing? So I go through this, I look at some other scholars, if I've missed something that they picked up on, I haven't yet. But understand, this is a similar condition of the Garden of Eden, except this is perfection. This is for everyone. Remember God walking in the evening in the garden? Um, the dwelling place of, free, of, of pre-fallen man. This is just even better. This is a grand city, the grand city. Notice the next line. It says again, he will dwell with, he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. Different way of putting it, but making the point. People is in the plural here. Uh, usually when you have people in the singular, it has to do with Israel. Here it's in the plural, so it'll be all the redeemed uh, from all of history. Uh, on the new earth. God had promised Abraham that he would be a blessing to all the people of the earth. Important passage in scripture. Uh, Galatians 3.8, we'll look at that one, but also uh, 16.28 and 29. Galatians 3.8, the scripture foresaw that God justifies the Gentiles by faith and pronounced the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying that all the nations will be blessed in you. And that's because Abraham was the uh, father of our faith. At the same time, he's also uh, the uh, father of the Jewish race, which eventually the descendant was Jesus Christ. And we trust in Christ. We are trusting in someone who came to life as a human through the line of Abraham. By the way, this line we see, I just read, is quoted from the old Abraham covenant, Genesis 12, 3. All the nations will be blessed in you. And notice again, the last line, the point is made again, and God himself. Notice this time we have in the Greek the word for himself, um, the personal pronoun, uh, the one that emphasizes God's presence here will be among them. Now, believer, this tells us that you're going to spend eternity with God. 
To me, that is a main point we're to grasp here. And it's said at least three times and implied other places as well. So three times showing the importance and the prevalence of this point in this passage. And this is the fulfillment of many of the earlier promises to God's people. Uh, a list here, Leviticus 26, 11, Jeremiah 24, 7, 30, 22, Ezekiel 37, 27, 48, 35, Zechariah 2, 10, 8, 8, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, and so on. Many verses on that. God will be with us because you and me are his people. Now, we have fellowship with God right now on earth. But this is the greater fellowship, as many things are, like the Spirit, um, the greater environment, eternity, and so on. Every time you hear me remind you to confess your known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9, that is saying you can have fellowship with God right now. But in the millennium, it'll even be much more. And then the ultimate and optimum, optimum fulfillment of God's presence among his people and fellowship is in the new Jerusalem. Let's kind of look at this as a review. Present earth fulfillment. I have taught this. It's one of the first things I teach in the Bakesies because it's so, so important and so many Christians don't even begin to understand it. And it's sad because if you're going to really walk with God, you're going to grow spiritually, you have to learn how to be in fellowship and live your life in fellowship with God. And it doesn't come automatically any more than your salvation. It's a choice you have to make constantly. You say, you've never heard that before? Well, this is one reason you may be hearing this lesson. You need to understand what it means to walk in fellowship with God and stay in fellowship if you're going to have that intimate relationship. Let's go to 1 John. I'm going to read a number of verses from this first chapter. I think that's on there. It's a little awkward here. Okay. 1 John 1, 3. Let's just start up here. John is writing, of course. This is in 1 John. What we've seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and notice what John says. And our fellowship, that's those who work with John, fellow believers. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John is saying, I'm writing this so you can understand what it means to be in fellowship. Just like we are in fellowship with the Father and the Son. Now understand, fellowship means communion, a closeness, a uh, very dear, you might say, uh, walk with someone in a level of intimacy. Like a close, close friend. Verse 4, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. In other words, I want you to have the joy I have. I want you to have great joy, a complete joy. Understanding what it means to have the joy the happiness of walking with God on this earth. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Principle made. Uh, point is, God is light. There's no darkness. It's analogous to sin. There's no sin in a close relationship with the Lord. Now, I say close relationship. I don't mean your initial salvation. Of course, you have to repent from sin uh, and turn to Christ in faith. But what I'm saying here is there's going to be sin in your life as a believer, and you have to deal with it. The point is, if you're going to be consistently close with the Lord in fellowship, you have to deal with sin because there's no sin with him. He's light, no darkness whatsoever. 
verse 6, he gives an illustration. If we say that we have fellowship with him and are walking in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Unfortunately, and I'm, I'm not people's judge, but it's common that those who think they're close to God are not because they got sin in their lives they haven't dealt with. You say, what kind of sin? All sin. The small laws, the small lies, the big lies, the white lies, the deception, lust, those things not confessed will hinder your fellowship with God. And if you're running around thinking you're in fellowship with God because you play the game and use the words and so-called walk the walk, you lie and you're not practicing the truth. Now, folks, this is for us, for our benefit. This is for all of us to understand how important it is to walk with God on earth. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the basics. It's one of the first lessons I teach about because it's so important. All right, let's read that again. If we say that we have fellowship with him and are walking in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what's this saying is, if you walk in the light, you're living your life with sin confessed. We have fellowship with one another. You can have it with fellow believers at a level that you can't have it with believers who aren't in fellowship. And you can usually tell after a time that you're not on the same frequency. And that may be within your own family. It may be within those who are in your church. Maybe in your Bible study group. But you have to show discernment. If you're in fellowship you're going to be walking with the Lord that only those in fellowship understand and appreciate. And God has provided this for all of us to be this close to him. But we have to deal with our sin if we're going to remain in fellowship. So again, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, notice, that means sin confessed, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, if there are sins you don't know you committed, they're covered too. But even if you don't know them to confess them, you are cleansed. God takes care of that. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let's just settle the fact, folks, that all of us are going to sin, uh, I, don't, I can't tell your own personal life, but I sin every day. Some days are better than others. So verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he forgives us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, you confess your sins as soon as you're aware that you've done it. That would be the ideal. The best ideal, you might say, is don't do it at all. Don't sin at all. But since you're going to sin, just be ready to confess it. And God is always there, faithful and righteous, so that he forgives us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you're probably thinking, some of you, you mean to tell me if I sin, all I have to do is confess it to get right with God? Yes. That's too easy. It's supposed to be easy. All the provisions have been made. God wants you to walk with him, but he can't let you do it if you're sinful, if you're in a sinful condition, if you're walking in the darkness, if you're straying away. You confess your sin. And this is our earthly fellowship, folks. So that's your earthly opportunity to walk with the Lord right now in intimate communion. It's important to confess your sins. In the millennial kingdom, well, that was promised. Uh, we see that in the prophets. Uh, Jeremiah 24, 7. 
I will also give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me wholeheartedly. So there you see there's a change of heart, and the idea of being my people can be reflected in your fellowship in the millennium. Zechariah 2.10 Shout for joy and rejoice, daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. So when it starts talking about dwelling with the Lord, that's fellowship. So what I'm saying is, right now on earth, we can have fellowship with God. Now it's true, we don't have a temple to go to, and there sits Jesus Christ. That will happen in the millennium. But at the same time, we'll also have the Spirit. So we will have the power of the Spirit with us, in that sense, we have fellowship with him. But in the, in the uh, eternal kingdom, it even gets better. So again, let me just say something about this verse that we're looking at. Three times in this one verse, it said that God will dwell or be among his people. That is the point. His presence is said in other ways. And we will get to those. In fact, the idea of God among his people dominates this, this much of this passage. This means that God's people will have direct access to serve God. This is one of the great rewards of being a conqueror, which further develops in chapter 22. Verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will not exist any more, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the former things have ceased to exist. Just like the old uh, heavens and earth. Let's break this down. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. This shows the constant care that God will have for his people. And death will not exist anymore. No death to the human being with God. There will be no longer any mourning. There will no longer be any mourning for death or sadness or any other reason. No sorrow for loss. Then we have the phrase, or crying, or crying. <laughs> I've thought of that line in that one movie. It says, there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in heaven, okay? There's no crying in heaven. The word's krage, wailing, outcry. And that reminds me, you know what else? No complaining. I'm just throwing that in. No complaining. You won't have anything to complain about. Another one we see here, or pain. That includes physical pain. Physical pain. The presence of God means that everything that caused any pain or sorrow will no longer occur. Death will be non-existent. No harm is to come. And then we have this explanation at the end of the verse. For the former things have ceased to exist. None of this will exist in heaven. All gone permanently with the old heavens and earth. So what we have here, and this is it, we have a rather limited description at this point. You might even call it an introduction of what's coming of what the eternal state will be like from the view of what it will not have. These negative life experiences will be non-existent. So we just saw a list of them. Uh, and I think what this tells us is that the things that God has in store, of a, store for us will be so wonderful, uh, we couldn't comprehend them if he told us. But because of our human experience, uh, it'll be glad. It'll be a good situation. We'll be glad to get rid of these things. This we can understand. But actually, little is said of the new heavens and earth, 
will have for us. We'll get a little bit more in New Jerusalem. And I think it is because, as I said, limited understanding, limited understanding of these eternal things. But just think of it for a moment. What would life be without grief or being upset or sad or crying or tears or pain or anguish or worry and so on and so on? All those negative things will be gone. It will not happen in the eternal state. They are non-existent on the new earth and the new Jerusalem. So John stops his description here of the new heavens and earth to relay an announcement from God. Verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write it down because these words are faithful and true. Now this is reinforcement, you might say. And he who sits on the throne, that would be God, God announces what he's doing. We see that word again, said, Behold, gets everyone's attention. I'm making everything new. You get it? So God is telling us what he's doing. Uh, this is an allusion, by the way, that all things new to Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. The all things here, the eternal earth will be new. We're not given any of the qualities or descriptions other than we can expect to be better than the millennial kingdom, which were temporary. We'll get a little of it in the rest of the chapters, which is only one full one. But it goes on to say, and he said, write it down. So, he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. That's what God said. Now an angel comes in. He says, Write it down. It could be that the angel was standing by as God's attendant, and John's not properly responding. He's probably amazed in awe, as I think anyone would be. But anyway, he's told to write it down. Why? Because these words are faithful and true. This is a way of saying it's a solemn guarantee that these words are absolute truth. It's going to happen. Whether too difficult to fully understand or not, it's going to happen. It's going to happen as God says it will. All right, so that's like saying, you need to get this down, John. This is going to happen. And I'm glad he did, because we get to study it. Verse 6. Then he said to me, they are done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water free of charge from the spring of the water of life. The idea is that this thrust us forward into the future, and once this is all done, and the new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem have come down, then you can say they are done, and that's the idea. Now, in God's mind, they're done, because he's already gotten his plan. It just hasn't happened yet, and from our perspective. But we're to understand this is perfectly guaranteed. Let's break this down. You'll have some differences in translation here, I think, even most modern translations. But let's start out. Then he said to me, God is speaking, they are done. Now, let's talk about this word for a moment. The word is genomai, perfect, active, indicative, and it's in the plural. Now, most of your translations, I think, translate it in the singular. They're sort of translating from the standpoint of this entire event. Uh, but literally, it does say it's in the plural. They are done. Now, perfect active indicative. The perfect tense means it's completed action. In the Greek, it means there's emphasis on the results or the state, the resulting state of things. So what this is saying, that all this is going to come into existence from, a, from our perspective. 
but it's viewed from the future perspective, future perspective as already done. So they come into being, they come into existence. They are done. And what does that refer to? To the all things or these words, basically the same thing. The old heavens and earth are gone. Those things that were with them, in them. The old mortal bodies are gone. The sinful bodies are gone. The decaying and sinful earth are gone. And a new eternal age has come. With a new heaven, a new earth, and a new dwelling place for God and his people to be together. These things are viewed as done. Then we see some of those familiar descriptions of God. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Using the Greek alphabet as an analogy, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letter, it's analogous to the beginning and the end. This is a way of saying that God controls creation. He is sovereign. He is also eternal. So he starts human history and he ends it. Then starts an eternal state with creatures capable of living in it forever. And it doesn't end. He's told us that. And his word is faithful. It's true. Now, it's also true that Christ has called himself this. But understand, God works through Christ. So this also applies to him. Christ says he's the Alpha and Omega. We'll see that later in 22, 12, and 13. There he, he changes it to, he says, the first and the last, not the beginning and the end, instead of the beginning and the end, you see. So he'll say, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the, the first and the last. Let me say that again. So Christ will say later on in Revelation 22, 12 through 13, that I am the Alpha and the Omega, uh, the first and the last where it has God saying it here on the beginning and the end. Mouse did the same thing. This tells us something about God. If you're into science a little bit, or perhaps uh, sciences that deal with uh, cosmology in some form or, or physics, God is the first cause and the last cause and is everything in between. I always like the analogy of it's like God's on top of the tallest building and the entire parade goes by and it's from the big, he can see the beginning of it and he can see the end of it. It's how God views time and the analogy. It's how he views creation. God's above it. He's over it. He's eternal. The creation we experience is temporary. So again, God is the first cause and the last cause and everything in between. Then we see this last phrase. Actually, it's a full sentence, isn't it? Of the gift of continuous life expressed in these words. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water free of charge from the spring of the water of life. Now, if you live in the desert, you know the value of water. A thirst was a frequent issue in that dry and warm, often hot climate in the land of Israel. So they could relate to this analogy very well. But thirst is also symbolic of spiritual thirst, something we see in the Old Testament more than once. It represents a thirst for God, a thirst for for truth, very important concept. Uh, it's on the level of the importance of fellowship in one's life, how much thirst you have for truth. If you don't have a thirst for truth, you may never learn about fellowship. Say, so what do you mean? Well, if you want the truth, God will provide it. If you don't, why should he bother? Psalm 42, 1 and 2. 63 1 Isaiah 12 3 44 3 has to do with thirsting for truth 
And that's what we have here. Let me read a couple of those scriptures to you. I'm going to start with uh, Psalm 42, 1 and 2. Probably familiar with you. I think it's one of those contemporary songs. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my inner self pants for you, O God. My inner self thirsts, thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? In other words, this is a hunger for being close to God, uh, being in fellowship. Psalm 63, 1. God, you're my God. I shall be watching for you. My soul thirst for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and exhausted land where there is no water. It's interesting because this is basically saying, I'm in a place where there's not much truth. Are you in one of those places? Is there truth being taught from the pulpit if you go to church? Or your get together? Sometimes those are called Bible studies, and there are serious Bible studies. Don't misunderstand, but I hope yours is if you get with other Christians. It's one of the wonderful things about modern technology. You can get together with other Christians and listen to a video. Um, this describes, this last part of this verse describes those who long for truth. If you don't long for truth, you're probably not going to be exposed to it. Or if you were, you probably won't know what you have. This sentence, by the way, is a promise. We have several passages similar to this. In Revelation, we've seen it. 7, 17, 22, 1. John 4 Gospel of John 4, 13 and 14. Listen to this. If you want the truth, last line. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water free of charge from the spring of the water of life. One of the great things about being in eternity, you'll have all the truth to satisfy your spiritual thirst. God has his spiritual nourishment free for his people. And by the way, it's free now too. All you need with no cost to you. It's one reason I never charge for any of my videos or anything like that. You don't have to give. Uh, and the only reason some of you do is because the Bible says that if your heart's right with him and basically you can afford it or you want to make a sacrificial gift, you can do that. That's part of our priesthood, to give uh, material blessings back to those who share the truth with us. But basically, and this is completely true, it doesn't cost you a thing. And this is the way it is with spiritual nourishment. God will provide that for you. The poorest person, if he just has some access to um, a source to listen to, well, these videos, he can listen to them for years with no charge. No one should be denied that. So God has spiritual nourishment free for his people. That's one of the conditions of being in the eternal kingdom. Another thing here, it says, uh, from the spring of the water of life. This is analogous again. Uh, water is symbolic of life. It's so important in the Middle East. So it's symbolic of spiritual life as well. Those dwelling with God in the new heavens and earth get a constant free flow of spiritual nourishment from God. This may be a contrast to what happened on earth to those who went for the wine of sexual impurity. Remember that in Babylon? Now, rather than the wine of sexual impurity, which the world went through, or went for, I should say, under the dominance of Babylon, we see this back in 17.4 and 18.3. 
you now, as a believer, have constant refreshment of the spiritual nourishment that God provides. Verse 7. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This takes what we've just seen a little further. Notice the one who conquers. We've seen that many times, especially back in those chapters to the, of the letters to the churches. The conqueror, the victor, the one who overcomes. Uh, saw that back in 2, 7, 11, 17, 26, 3, 5, 12, and 21. Seven times for all seven churches. The emphasis here, though, is on the individual. The one who conquers. To each and every conqueror. Do you hear that, believer? To every victor, to every overcomer, one who overcomes all the things that would draw him away from being faithful. He, notice, the one who conquers, will inherit these things. These things are the conquerors to be his own. When you inherit something, it becomes yours. There's a lot of reason for us to be joyful. Just think about the eternal things. The list we have, the things we won't have that we don't want. You can have all the crying and pain and sorrow you want. I don't care for that. That hurts. It's painful. The idea is that these things belong to him, to you, to me. These things are the things of the new creation, the new heaven and earth and a place in the new Jerusalem where God will dwell and we will be with him. And then this last phrase, look at it. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Notice, still individually oriented here. The only reference to sonship in Revelation, but nevertheless, it shows a special relationship conquering believers have with God. He's your God. You're his child. This makes it more personal than just his people or among them. You are a child of God. Here the word son includes, of course, men and women. You're a son of God. We receive the inheritance because we are so connected to God in an eternal relationship as a son of God through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It's interesting because the last verse which is really got a lot to it. We're going to wait and look at it last time. It then describes the last verse I mean in this section, verse 8. This will describe those who don't have a relationship with God, who inherit nothing but eternal punishment for rejecting their creator. And that's where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your eternal word, your perfect word, your truth. Help us understand that these are the way, these are absolute truths and the way things are going to be. Challenge us with what we've heard. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.